we do see differences among fat sources, of course, in, in Clayton, we can go into those. But in terms of answering the question, you know, should I value fat more in the summer or the winter in terms of the energy loadings that I'm putting on that fat source? Um, this research uh, project answered that question uh, for us, or at least helped us answer that question to say, yes, you can use the same specs within your formulation matrix. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Trey Kellner, a managing partner and swine nutritionist for AMVC, and also one of the hosts of the Swine It Podcast. So Trey, I'm sure most of the listeners here have heard your podcast and already know about your background a little bit, but in case there are any new listeners, could you tell the audience a little bit about what you do and what your role is at AMVC? Sure. And thanks for having me, Clayton. So as you said, I, I kind of have wear two hats for our team. The first is our managing partner. So I oversee the, the business and strategy and implementation of those strategies for our nutritional services division. And then the second hat that I wear is our swine nutritionist. So I oversee the feed program design from formulation to feed mill to at the slat level implementation as well. And overall, try to manage the checkbook for our own production and our, our customers' production as well. Like you, we know feeding pigs is a challenge. At Alltech, our proven specialty ingredients work to solve your toughest challenges. Whether it's combating mycotoxins, increasing feed efficiency, or just getting a few extra pigs per litter, Alltech's full line of trace minerals, enzymes, prebiotics, and other specialty ingredients are backed by science and real customer success. Start seeing maximized health, sustainability, and profitability in your pigs, and more free time for you by visiting alltech.com slash pig today. Gotcha. So I saw the study you sent to me um, about the time back when you were in, during your PhD, looking at the relationship between heat stress and dietary fat. So what kind of relationship did you see? How did the heat stress affect the pig's response to the added dietary fat? Yeah, sure. So maybe a quick introduction, because as I like to say, this is ancient history research and kind of a, an old time, right? So it's crazy to think that fat used to be below 30 cents per pound. So back in, you know, the mid 2000 and mid 2010s, um, fat was an option that um, swine nutritionists and producers might use to maintain barn throughput um, throughout the summer months. Right. So during my master's and Ph.D. research, I focused a lot on, you know, fat digestibility, fat metabolism and ultimately how that fat's deposited and how that affects carcass fat quality um, within our carcasses. So throughout that research, there was a question about is fat used different by the pig under heat stress conditions? Because in our wean to finish rations, that's when fat is most likely to be implemented or be at the highest concentration. Now, of course, today, you know, we, we haven't used a lot of fat in the past two or three years because A, it's been expensive and B, the pork market's been depressed. So I thought this would be timely because A, fat's come down a little bit. You can buy fat, you know, now for about 39 cents per pound, at least in the Midwest. Um, and we're coming into more profitable times for the first time in a couple of years. So this old ancient research might be dust off um, by a couple people as they decide, hey, should fat be part of our wean to finish strategy or not? Um, so that was kind of the reason for bringing this back up and, and thought that I would, you know, help those uh, fellow swine nutritionists and producers out. So the first main takeaway is A, um, heat stress really does not impact um, how fat is used by the pig. The digestibility values were the same. Uh, the feed conversion values were the same. And therefore, the ultimate, you know, energy value that we place on those fat sources is the same whether that pig was heat stressed, whether that pig was pear fed, meaning we had the same intake, or whether that pig was on control. Now, we do see differences among fat sources, of course, in, in Clayton, we can go into those. But in terms of answering the question, you know, should I value fat more in the summer or the winter in terms of the energy loadings that I'm putting on that fat source, um, this research uh, project answered that question uh, for us, or at least helped us answer that question to say, yes, you can use the same specs within your formulation matrix. Gotcha. And depending on the fat source that you use, did you see any difference in a response? 
Yeah, so in this study and then also within, you know, other masters and PhD work, we do see differences among sources. And in generality, right, there is you look through each one of our, our research projects, right? There there are subtle outliers or differences, but in generality, um, more saturated sources such as a beef tallow or a palm oil or you know anything like that um, have a have a lower energy value and digestibility value to those sources that are more unsaturated and that's not breaking news we've known that since the 1920s right however what was unique in our research that we found in, in another study that wasn't in, in this particular one is that we saw a bigger impact when free fatty acid content um, was higher in value. So when we get above 15%, you know, clear up, you know, to 30% or 40% free fatty acids, you know, that affects the digestibility of those fat sources and lowers our energy value compared to what you'd find in the NRC 2012, right? So it, that's important to think about as you're evaluating fat sources and thinking about potentially putting them back into your finishing rations this summer is not only what the, the structural composition of those fat sources are, meaning, you know, are they saturated, are they monounsaturated, are they polyunsaturated, what's the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, right, all those considerations, but hey, just the basics, right, how much moisture is in this source, how much impurities are in the source, what's the free fatty acid composition, right, those those type of basic, you know, fundamentals that we've used to characterize our fat sources for a long time that maybe we haven't, you know, worried about over the past four or five years because fat's just been so expensive. Kind of keep that in mind, do the analysis before you purchase, and then as you purchase to make sure that you're getting the, the correct value for the dollar you're spending on that source. So I also saw in this study that there was a body condition difference with the pear fed pigs, which to my understanding were given the same amount of feed that the heat stress pigs ate, but in thermal neutral conditions, so kind of limit fed a little bit. Uh, but there's a difference in body condition between them and the heat stress pigs. And you mentioned that even though they had the same amount of intake, this can be explained because of the difference in the lipolytic cascade and how that affected the body condition. So could you dig into that and kind of explain a little bit about how the lipolytic cascade affected the body condition of these two different treatments? Yeah, sure. So, you know, these results are, are very similar to Lance Baumgard, who is a co-author on this, you know, how he's characterized what happens with, within a pig and, and as his graduate students have as well. Um, so in, in generality, once again, uh, I can get more basic and more specific on this, but to, to keep it simple, um, when the pig is heat stressed, when it's hot in the summer, the last thing that that pig wants to do is generate more heat, right? It's hot enough, right? They're trying to dissipate heat. Of course, the pig is highly insulated, doesn't have a lot of sweat glands, right? So how it, you know, tries to dissipate heat is uh, increase its respiration rate, first of all, right? To try to dissipate it. And then second of all, try to do everything to try to decrease heat as much as possible. So A, their activity level goes down. B, their intake level goes down, right? Because when we eat, we release heat and we generate heat um, throughout those processes. And then C, what we have consumed, we're gonna try to make sure that we take the most efficient routes possible in terms of you know, metabolizing and depositing those nutrients to generate the least amount of heat as possible. So the most efficient route for fat that's consumed in a heat stressed animal is to be deposited as fat versus then changing its structure to be used, you know, for maintenance or, you know, protein deposition or anything like that, right? The, the least amount of heat that's generated in that process is taking fat that's within the feed and depositing it as fat within the pig, right? So we see that within the study. So even though our heat stress pigs and our pear fed pigs were fed the same amount, meaning the same calories, same diet, same nutrients, et cetera, um, were in the same conditions. However, they were just at thermal neutral conditions instead of heat stress conditions. Our heat stress pigs are, are significantly fatter, right? So that might be one thing to think about if your pigs are being marketed on a percent lean basis or have that premium grid associated um, when we're thinking about including fat or not, right? So if we have that premier discount structure in there and we're trying to do the math on, hey, what should our energy level be? What should our fat level be, et cetera? Know that a heat stress pig is more likely to retain 
um, you know, dietary fat as, as carcass fat, right? So if we're being measured on a percent lean basis, that's a factor. Second thing too, is then also on the pair fed basis, right? So if we're kind of under that energy max intake and, and we see this in, in most limit fed studies throughout literature, once again, this is not breaking news. Well, what's going to happen? Well, fat that might have been deposited um, is going to be utilized more for other processes, whether that's, you know, just to maintain body weight and processes or the immune system, whatever it may be, or, or to maintain the protein and lean accretion that we already have. Right. So when we look at those animals and within these, these extreme models, right, where we have an animal that's severely heat stressed versus an animal that's thermal neutral, but has that same, de you know, depression and in feed intake, we get two very different final endpoints of what their carcass looks like um, in terms of fat deposition. The interesting thing that we found, however, within this experiment is we thought that the characteristics of the carcass fat between those two extreme models would be different, right? We thought there might be differences um, in IV value or fatty acid composition or, you know, um, any Bella characteristic, you know, tests that we had in terms of quality, whether that be, you know, fat color score or the old flop test or a durometer. And we saw no differences between those two. So it was just simply the, the, the quantity of fat it was presence within those carcasses, um, even though they ate the exact same amount of fat, the exact same amount of energy and the exact same of amino acids, uh, the, the quantity of fat that was in those carcasses between our pair fed animals and the heat stress animals were dramatically different. So that, that was kind of interesting to find. And, and to our knowledge, the first that's um, really taken a dive into that. And then one other question I had, um, quick question, this kind of ties back into a little bit of what you've just been talking about. Um, but you mentioned in the abstract that the heat stress barrows required more energy than those pear fed barrows. Was that also due to the difference in the, the uh, lipolytic cascade? Exactly, right? Yep. Those are just differences that we're seeing between the two biological models. Gotcha. Well, thank you, Trey, for coming on the show. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Oh.